Everyone's aware of the tragedy that's taking place in Israel, the October 7th terrorist attack by Hamas and the 1,500 dead and the over 200 hostages. And now, of course, Israel's gone to war and, and, and uh, bombings in Gaza and incursions. There is a lot going on. It's very serious. It has you know, a lot of uh, negative potential uh, um, from there. And so uh, I was delighted when um, uh, Antonio Garcia Martinez, um, uh, I found out that you know, he had just come back uh, uh, from Israel, and I asked him to come and sort of share some of his insights and what he's learned on the ground in his experience. Now, a little bit about um, AGM. So he's a startup founder, sound familiar? He's a MarTech technologist. He was a PM at, uh, at Facebook and wrote about it in his New York Times bestseller, Chaos Monkeys. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, book. It was a great summer uh, read. Uh, who knew ad tech uh, could be so fun? Um, and, but beyond that, so, so, so now you know he's a technologist and he's a, and he's a writer, but he's so much more. He's like a, he's a historian. Um, he studies religion. Um, he's, he's kind of like a Renaissance man if the Renaissance man was uh, in the image of Hunter S. Thompson because you know he's, a, he's the kind of person that when there's trouble, he runs towards it, uh, not against it. So when the UK, Ukraine war broke out, he went to Ukraine. Uh, and when the uh, war in Israel broke out, he went to Israel. Uh, Antonio, come on up. And uh, maybe I can... Uh, Maybe, oh, and sorry, I'm sorry, and, and now he's founder and CEO of Spindle, which uh, is a uh, Web3 uh, attribution company, if I got that right. Hey, Terrence. Hey. I don't know if I can live up that introduction, I have to say. Right? It's a little bit over the top, to be I honest. I don't know. Renaissance, um, Hunter S. Thompson. Cool. Why, why, why do you go towards the shooting? Um, it is true. Uh, I think someone made a joke that I'm like a startup founder, that the moment a war starts, I grabbed the bulletproof vest and I got on the plane, which has only happened twice, to be clear, once in the Ukraine, once in Israel. In the case of Israel, there is kind of a backstory. It's probably not a conversation for here, but I did, I did convert to Judaism because I have three Jewish kids, so there is sort of somewhat a connection to, to Israel. I also have business partners and a couple of angel investments there. The war started, I just happened to be in Portugal at a crypto conference, and so I did the insane thing, and I kind of got on the plane and went to Israel to see kind of what was going on. Um, so yeah, that's how I ended up in Israel shortly after the, uh, the work kicked off. Yeah. So you spent a week in Tel Aviv. Did you move around? Yeah, it was, it was almost two weeks. Uh, at some two point, weeks. my investors were calling me saying, Antonio, what, what are you doing in Israel exactly? <laughs> I'm like, why are you there? Uh, by the way, did we get a key man policy in the uh, fundraise? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so um, I, I spent a little bit in Tel Aviv. The, the funny thing about Israel, I'm sure people here have probably been there, it's incredibly small. It's like. Yeah. If you actually lay out a map on the Bay Area, it's roughly the size of the greater Bay Area, actually. So you can be in Tel Aviv, startup nation, and be in a war zone in roughly 45 minutes. And so I kind of did rove around a little bit. Um, of course, the war zone extends to Tel Aviv. There's rocket attacks and alarms and stuff that go off. Um, it's comical, but I was taking business meetings from there. One of them breaks out in the middle of the, uh, middle of the Zoom meeting. All the sirens go off. You have 45 seconds to kind of run for shelter. Uh, the way it works there, the radar is so good. If you hear the alarm, you know you're going to get hit. It's not like, oh, the city's getting hit. It's like, no, no, no. Your neighborhood is getting hit. So you book it for the one safe room. And here I was with my business associate. We're on a call in the United States. We're like running into the safe room. We're in the supply closet. There's like brooms and stuff. And then, um, I mean, I'm, I'm saying it's funny because, of course, in you know, war zone, you have sort of gallows humor about it. Um, and then the way it works is, again, you, you hear the booms go off. So the Iron Dome rockets go up, and then you hear the explosions go, and the building shakes. And you keep on talking about ad tech and attribution and marketing analytics and on-chain <laughs> transactions as if nothing happened. And, and of course, on the, you, you know, humans adapt to things. And in, in Israel, everyone's used to living this way. Of course, the American team is saying, what is going on? Do we need to call anybody? Like, are you guys OK? I'm like, yeah, 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 don't worry about it. Boom, 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 right? Um, so yeah, that's, uh, people keep on living their lives. So the, the whole startup nation thing is real, as you yep. know. And uh, the startups are trying to operate. Um, one of the things they experience, it's a, it's a conscript army. A lot of uh, people have to go serve. Right. And so all the young engineers, almost all of them are reservists, and so they get called up. Um, Israel has almost 450,000 men and women under arms, which is a huge fraction of the population, 9 million people. Right. Um, and so things are a little slow, uh, you know, uh, economically. But I think what you see, I'm just going to riff on random anecdotes, Tara, instead sure. of if you have a question. Right, right. um, one experience I had that was interesting in Tel Aviv, the, there's a park called Expo Tel Aviv. Some of you have probably been there if you've been to conferences. It's the equivalent of the Moscone Center in San Francisco, if you're familiar, huge conference center. You go there, it's been totally taken over by non, like, non-profits, you know, civic organizations that are trying to mobilize the war effort. 
If you've never been in a country under conditions of total war, and I've been in two, Ukraine and, and Israel, it's an incredible experience. It's like nothing you've ever imagined. I mean, the loosest analogy I can imagine is like a, a football game in a small Midwestern town, right? Like literally everything is about that thing. In this case, though, it's actually war. And so in this case, you have literally, I was being walked around by the, um, the president of Payoneer, which is like a NASDAQ-listed online payments company, like a major company. And she's one of the organizers of one of these things. And you had what, basically a WeWork taken over by, the, and it looks like you'd think it's a startup, but actually it's people doing the, the ops business of finding clothing, food, lodging, et cetera. It's a lot of internally placed refugees inside Israel. They've evacuated both the North and the South. And so everyone, imagine like the craziest Y Combinator startup you've ever seen, except they're not hacking away, they're kind of solving the operational problems of, an, of a nation basically going to war. Um, so there was that, and then in the parking garage underneath it, again, imagine a huge parking garage, like something at the Moscone or the Javits Center in New York, and it's totally taken over by donations that everyone's donating, and then mobilizing under armed guard to the south, to where the, the war is mobilizing. And so it's, um, even in Tel Aviv that you think of being, you know, Miami with a startup ecosystem, it really is uh, a very different feeling when you're there under, there right now. Uh, when nations go to war, it, it often can be unifying for the nation. W yep. What does it feel like? Is, 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 is Israel unified right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's funny, I was there four months ago. Some of you who follow Israel news might know there's a lot of political turmoil there due to this court reform business. There's a lot of, you know, sort of political fragmentation. Uh -huh. Same thing we have here, frankly. Um, but for different reasons. That was four months ago. I, I went back there now and it's completely unified. In fact, the, the scene I just painted to you of all that organization going on, People who organized that were actually the groups who were resisting the government, actually, who were organizing these protests, who literally within a minute pivoted to mobilizing for the war effort and stopped complaining about the government. Um, so yeah, it's very unified. It, I have to say there's a, <laughs> this, is why, this is why you get on the plane to go, by the way. Um, the outside narrative about Israel is, of course, everything that I'm sure you're seeing in your feeds. Inside, it's a very different story, mm. both how Israelis perceive themselves and the sort of general vibe. Um, you know, outside it's a story about ripping posters and this and that and right. the protests. Inside, it's, it's all about the war effort, it's about getting the hostages back. Um, you know, Israel's a small country. Everyone knows someone who was killed or kidnapped, like literally everybody. Like the moment you meet somebody, it's like, oh yeah, the, you know, the son of uh, the guy that I work with, he, you know, they got killed in the kibbutz or whatever. Or they're, they're disappeared, they could be kidnapped, you don't know. Um, you know, people have done the math, whatever it is, 1,400 people works out to something like hundreds of thousands of people in the United States. Imagine that level of tragedy in which everyone had somebody involved. That's kind of what it's like. And, but are the people, do they have optimism? Do they oh, view yeah. it as intractable? What, what's the... It was, it was hard to get a flight into Israel because they're totally packed with Israelis going back to defend right. the homeland. Yes, right. That's right. Yeah. Well, that's, that's fine. That means they're rallying to the support of their nation. But, but what do they th think about the long-term ramifications or? I think nobody thinks that far ahead. The, right. the goal is to obviously completely wreck Hamas and then after that we'll see. Um, I think everyone's kind of giving a pause to the political conversation, not mentioning Bibi too much, even right. though he may or may not be popular depending who you're talking to. And ju they're just focusing on getting the hostages back, bringing, a war to, bringing the war to an end. I don't know whether a comparison of war situations is even appropriate, but since you were in both locations, any sense for how they feel different, the same? You're comparing Ukraine to, to yeah. Israel, yeah. Um, so I was in Ukraine, in the western part of Ukraine mostly, during the first couple weeks of the war. Um, it was different. There was a massive refugee problem. So a quarter of Ukraine basically fled in the first month. So you had literally men in arms going east and women and children going west and you would just sit in Lviv and just see the, literally men and women going this way and trucks and men going this way. Um, Israel's different. There isn't, I mean, there are internally displaced refugees, but it's not like people are leaving Israel. Um, in, in Ukraine, you had all of Europe showing up to help, you know, Ukraine. I mean, it, it was really quite heartening. Yep. In Israel, not so much. <laughs> Israel's kind of on its own. I mean, obviously it's getting in from the United States, but you don't have, you know, it's, it does feel a little besieged as a, as a nation. Um, right. And they always kind of feel that way, but particularly in, uh, during wartime, it's, it's definitely this feeling of um, circling the wagons, so to speak. But it's, certainly this administration's shown support and has flown over yeah. there to fly the flag and, and- Oh, which was hugely meaningful, by the way. Everyone loves Biden, by the way, in, in Israel, because he showed up, he made a very strong statement. He showed up actually shortly after I landed when rockets were still landing all the time in Tel Aviv airport. So I don't even know how that you managed to fly in an American president when rocket attacks are going out three or four times a day. Right. Somehow they did it. So yeah, no, that was received extraordinarily well, actually, in Israel. So, Biden, so Biden is super popular. Israel's pro-US pro right now. I mean, it, yeah. yeah. Oh, always has been, I suppose, given the, they cash the checks. Uh, um, and there's been a long, long-term uh, uh, partnership there. Um, 
it feels like the global response has been puzzling to me, but, but um, maybe that's just me. What has... What is Israel doing wrong? Is it a marketing failure? Uh, mm. The globe so it doesn't feel like they're totally on board. That would, that would be us venturing into politics here, Terrence. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay. I, I think one thing I definitely, just speaking as like a media professional who's, I think he mentioned I wrote a book, I was like a media blue check guy for a while and lived off like the spectacle. I think, I think what you're seeing is that I mean, Israelis are kind of bad at PR, right? Like, if you look, see the messaging right. coming out of Israel, like, it's actually quite bad. From, again, just speak, like, not taking a position on the war, just objectively, like, it's just not effective as a message. I think part of what's going on is the perception of Israel and itself, the, the internal narrative is so different than the Western narrative. It's, it's difficult to coalesce those two views of the world. Again, it's um, how to explain it without um, kind of going over the edge here. Uh, again, they, they very much feel like it's a family tribal affair, right? Like, and this isn't very far away. You drive half an hour and you get to places where you still see bloodstains on the streets from the attacks, right? It's a very personal, visceral thing. I think in the outside, it's, it's a morality play or a political game, or it's a projection of, frankly, American political neuroses on some other, world, some other part of the world that a lot of people here, frankly, don't understand. Yep. And so to there, it's a real lived experience, and to everyone else, it's like a Twitter fight. And I think it's very difficult for those in that world to understand that it is a Twitter fight to other people and put themselves in that mentality. And so they just don't see it. Um, yeah. And so I, I had to, <laughs> one of the oddest conversations I had was actually with uh, one of the founders of one of the startups we work with, I won't name names, but whatever. And um, he's like, I don't understand. How is it that like the Western left is lined up against us, right? The Israeli left is like the most crunchy, you know, kibbutz, work the land, socialist left you've ever met. There's like an actual socialist left there. Like how is it they're on the side of Hamas? And uh, it was hard to explain to him. Like, he just sort of didn't get it, I think, that the way the, the political sort of dice kind of roll in the US, Israel is perceived as being like a right wing sort of thing. Um, but a lot of things are flipped in Israel. The military is mostly run by the left, for example, and here right. it's kind of a right wing thing. So you know, a lot of things are flipped in Israel versus here. Well, it's, uh, it's disheartening and, and worrying. What, uh, what can people do to help if they want to? I mean, there's, there's a huge number of charities um, that, I mean, I, could, I don't know if I want to mention random names, but I, there's a lot of charities. If you want to get involved, you can def absolutely get involved. Yep. Um, there's uh, Brothers in Arms is one of them. Uh, Civil War Room is another one. These are all the organizations that used to be part of the protest movement and now are basically helping. Um, it, one thing we saw is, you know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of benefactors, many of them Jewish in the United States, were shipping supplies to, to Israel. Mm -hmm. So you'd go to the airport, you just see these huge boxes of body armor, supplies, whatever they needed. Um, I think the initial rush of that is kind of over. I don't think they right. need a uh, bulletproof vest anymore. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I yeah. believe Ben Gurion is still open. It, it's well, only Alal is flying. Right. Every other airline has chickened out. Nobody, uh, you, you have to fly in Alal. Ah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess they're. You, yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't use my United Elite status to fly into Tel Aviv with uh, Eretz Sirens going. Unfortunately, they don't. Uh, they don't do oh that. wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, to support, the reason why I went at the end of the day, like, you know, I donated money and stuff, but really trying to tell that story and tell the reality of it. I, again, the reason why I went to Ukraine and Israel is, I guess, the way we view it from our world through, you know, Twitter, and which is a very biased prism, just trying to tell the truth of what it, just today, I mean, if you care to follow up, I published a piece on Tablet Magazine about it. I also uh, tweeted a series of photos I took when I was wandering around southern Israel. Just seeing the reality as it kind of is, I think is, um, I don't know, something one can do or engage with rather than trying to project our own politics on a different region of the world. Right. You, know? um, you can write another book? Oh, God. Everyone asked me that question. Um, I don't know. We'll see if, uh, you know, if, Web if, we're, if we're actually at the cusp of another bull market in Web3 and crypto and it takes off again, then I'm, I know you're a skeptic, Terrence, by the way. But, uh, I have, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Admit it. At least I'm, I'm transparent about it. <laughs> um, we'll see. Great. Cool. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you went and came back safely. Yes. Um, appreciate having you. Oh, thanks, Darren. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me.